The place of Holy Scripture. This is the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. I am grateful to God that He has allowed for me to become a part and has given me the opportunity to accept the truth. And just like you all, to dwell in this truth. This word is taken from the sermons of pastors that he had spoken approximately five years ago. We discover that this is very important for those who have placed in their heart and have accepted hope Hope in meeting with the Lord and to participate in rapture and of course has been armed with this idea and has dedicated his life fully in order to fulfill this calling and to meet him in glory as brother Sasha had just sang in the joyful state because some, when they see these events, they are going to yell for someone to cover them for the one who is coming on the throne. How can they hide from it? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We constantly hear these three verbs. This is to set aside, to renew, and to be clothed. And we are currently studying clothing of ourselves into the new man, and we have discovered this process in seven components, each of which finds its definition and its expression in Scripture. A person who is clothed in a linen clean and bright is a person who is clothed in the garments of salvation. This is taken from the place of Scripture. He has clothed me in the garments of salvation, has clothed me in the in the garments of righteousness. In this manner, the Lord will demonstrate this incorruption and this action of the resurrection of Christ in the bodies of saints. This process is contained is in sowing and reaping. To be crowned with a person who is clothed in a pure linen, clean and bright, is a person who is crowned with the crown of a bridegroom. He is clothed in the jewels of a bride, clothed in marital garments, clothed in a linen, pure and bright, and represents the power of Lord of Hosts, Yahweh Lord of Hosts. And the dignity of the new man in the tripartite dimension is expressed in the garments of the dignity of a king, dignity of a prophet, and dignity of a priest. The authority and the powers of a king is called to establish in the limits of our essence the laws of the Most High and to bring to fulfillment His judgments and justice. You know, and last Friday is a continuation of this idea, and we've been hearing this for a while, but when I heard this, this taken from Isaiah chapter 33, that the king is going to reign, in righteousness, and the princes are going to reign according to his law, I, right away, I paid attention to this idea, this thought. And I saw, here is a definition, and now it is unveiled so deeply and in such great detail as we remember. When the king will reign, or when God, he is the king the Lord of Lords and we are called this king must reign in us we have heard that this is our new man he sits on the throne he is lifted up on the throne and there occurs 
God's glory, God's fullness, and this testifies that the church of God is coming to the fullness and in it begins to be expressed these qualities, these orders of God. And the princes are the helpers. As we always hear that there is a spirit and then there is uh, there is a spirit, the doorpost, and then there is the part of the door that that unites both doorposts. And this is the mind. And of course, all of this occurs in the inmost man, in our essence. So the authority and the powers of the king is called to establish in the limits of our essence the laws of the Most High to bring to fulfillment the judgments of his justice. And we remember that these are going to be princes. They are going to serve. A person will endure trials. Whatever wind may rise, whatever tempest may rise, he will be able to withstand it. There will be some kind of trial. He is going to be able to withstand it. This means that this person truly represents the kingdom of heaven. He has accepted this word, and it has reached some kind of fullness in him. This foolishness will not be acceptable. Sometimes, when a person is an infant, sometimes he considers certain things foolishness. He he does foolish things and tries to portray it as something that is so godly but when there is maturity then this is not allowed anymore this is disorder there is enlightenment there is the law of righteousness and it is established and it is established in the body of a person through the proclamation of the truth the fruit of the lips that sanctify it the authority of the powers of a prophet which is essential and the main is in our essence called to endow us with the dignity of kings and priests and to establish the limits of our calling in the boundaries of our responsibility. would love for there to be more prophets. At one time Moses had said, Oh, if among the people of God, if everyone were prophets, but you know, not everyone are prophets. God places one person, and through this person he gives, he establishes authority to establish certain uh, royal rules, order of the kingdom of heaven. And we are called to accept this word and to establish it for ourselves. And the authority and the powers of priests in our essence is called to represent the holiness of God and to fulfill the service of intercessors. By studying these seven signs and being clothed into the new man, they will help us understand the instructions of dedication into the dignity of a king, a priest, and a prophet. The king of kings and lord of lords. So, we are called to rule over our essence in the limits of our calling. In order for God to clothe a person into the garments of righteousness, this person must fulfill the conditions of discipleship expressed an active humility. That's why we are here. This is active humility. Stand and go. If you have questions that said, stand, go. And go ask and find out. It's written in 1 Peter 5, 5. Many people have not come to be disciples and to express this active humility and to listen to the wisdom which God gives through His prophet. But the Word of God says to us again in 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. This state of being clothed in humility causes the grace of God because God again resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5 garments of righteousness contain in themselves three dignities of power. This is the dignity of the supreme judge, the dignity of a supreme legislator, and the dignity of supreme commander. As the supreme legislator, God in the garments of righteousness establishes the rules and relations, rules regarding relations. And as a supreme judge, 
in the garments of righteousness, he places his judgment as light to the peoples. And as the supreme commander, God, through the new man, through his garments of righteousness, brings his judgment to fulfillment. The legislation itself is yielded by the word of God, which he has magnified and has exalted above all of his name. I was reading this sign before, and the beginning was the word, the sign here on this pulpit. That's why we look at this word, because in the beginning was the word. We understand that this was the beginning. On Friday, when I had heard this explanation, this interpretation, I had heard it that the king is going to reign according to righteousness. I had heard it anew. I am trying to pass along my my interest in this and perhaps you have this interest as well but just to remind us I I had seen our stories together history the pastor had said prophecies are history that is written history that is written in advance usual stories written a thousand years have passed but prophets write history in advance a foreshadow And every so stories that we know of, um, a lot of them come from what has already happened in certain different events. Someone may twist this this story to fit his needs, but God writes this story in advance, and then He reveals it. There comes a time it begins to be revealed. I had heard that this word is un- is being unsealed right now. God's promises, so it's. Let it be, meaning it is going to happen right now. God prophesies His word, and of course, saints accept this word. And depending on our spiritual age, this word begins to quickly grow in us, or perhaps lower in some. And God is waiting for a certain harvest from this word. So we are called to this. Specifically right now, God is giving us this flow of His promises. Allow us to accept it with trembling. We must look at it again. We must study it. We must dig into it so that it can bring fruit. God, as a commander of righteousness, for the fulfillment of every decree into fulfillment, uses his army that is comprised of many unions of truth which find their expression in the garments of righteousness that yield the new man. The body of a person clothed in the garments of righteousness are double garments. Remember, there is linen clothing, and then above it is cotton that is worn. This is the only instrument pastor writes here that is specifically double garments the body of a person that is clothed in the garments of righteousness double garments this is the only instrument through which the spirit of god can fulfill his work in man as well as on the planet earth and god said let us make man in our image according to our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 1, 26. Another place of scripture. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. John 5, 27. Judgment in the expression of the garments of righteous, righteousness is a retribution or the harvest of what was sown. And in order for this harvest to... To step into power, it's necessary for that saints being clothed in the garments of righteousness to affirm this harvest on earth according to the will of God that dwells in heaven. That's how we pray. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6.10 The ability to acknowledge the mind of the Lord in order to judge his actions in, in this manner, to be clothed in our new man in the subject of garments of righteousness. So that in this process, we can actively participate, it's necessary to know the mind of the Lord. His thoughts. 
which thoughts he has about his people, and these thoughts are revealed. And the ability to acknowledge the mind of the Lord in order to judge his intentions and in this manner to be clothed into a new man in the subject of garments of righteousness is contained in the ability and opportunity to know the paths of the Lord in the cooperation of his mercy with his truth. It is these two dignities in the subject of divine mercy and truth yielding the paths of the Lord are contained in his intentions and they are the fundamental discipline and standard according to which are called to flow relations or the communication of God's chosen remnant with God and God with his chosen remnant. Hosea chapter 14 verses 6 through 10. I will be like the dew to Israel. So God is going to send his dew in his order. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. The greatness of this This, it says that the righteous will be like a palm tree and he will have the greatness of Lebanon his branches shall spread and his beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon those who dwell under his shadow shall return they shall be ri- revived like grain and grow like a vine their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. Here we can see the thought of Pastor in his notes that we are called to look at the root. That this glory of Lebanon means that she is going to lengthen his roots like Lebanon. In this manner, Whatever the Lord may do through us, however He may bless us, however He may gift us, and however He may lift us up, we must always look at the Alpha. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the one who began this in you, and I am the one with whom you have cooperated. You have listened to my voice, but the glory belongs to the one who began this work. And the one who was strong enough to finish it. I am the Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. I begin and I end. And two examples that came to memory. This was Ezekiel. Hezekiah, when he was when he was sick, and how was his prayer built? He said, Lord, remember what I have done, how I have walked. Pay attention. And the Lord, along with him, looked at this, what he had done, what Hezekiah had done, and then he had left us an image so that we can learn a certain principle that we shouldn't before God or before someone say, look at what I've done. Okay, you've done well, but don't look at that. Look at the root of righteousness that holds you. Apostle Paul also had looked and he had said so that I am not magnified with the revelations he saw that God had revealed to him so deeply the deep truths and somehow he had begun to look at this the Lord has revealed it to me I have sought him I had sought to learn about him. Imagine the apostle, apostle, we had heard this explanation from pastor and, and because I began to be lofty the Lord allowed this to happen. When we hear this instruction, it's best to learn on the experience of others. An older person is telling you, do this. Don't test this. When we begin to test this, these lessons, these lessons become experienced by us. Therefore, we must look at the root of righteousness in us. 
So it says that the king is going to reign according to righteousness means that he is going to be based on that righteousness which God had placed in him. And then Apostle Paul had always said, therefore not my will, but the grace that is with me, this grace of God, according to this grace, he could act and do according to the will. According to the words that we have read, the ways of the Lord shown in the cooperation of His mercy and truth are the ways of justice upon which God fulfills His judgments and demonstrates His retribution, because of which the righteous are given the right and power to walk along these ways in order to fulfill the justice of God, whereas the lawless fall on these ways. They stumble on the discipline of curses and blessings which yield the justice of the Lord on the paths of His mercy and truth. And therefore, to know the mind of the Lord and to give appraisal to the intentions and thoughts that are contained in the Spirit of the Lord in the subject of the cooperation of His mercy with truth, we begin to study on what conditions is the unique order of cooperation contained in the cooperation of the mercy of the Lord with His truth, or God with man and man with God, as it is written, Psalms chapter 84, verses 11 through 14. Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before Him, and shall make His footsteps our pathway. The fruit of the cooperation upon the paths of the Lord between the mercy and truth that have met together and the righteousness and peace have kissed is finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Last Tuesday we had spoken with I had spoken with Daniel he was saying we must find not find not just grace in the eyes of God but in people as well and asked why well I understand pastor's opinion is very important if he says something gives a correction or so forth but why in the eyes of other people must we find grace and he says you know it is important it's important to search for this grace from saints as well and then I read how have I not read this before Find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. It turns out that this is important. God does want this. And he said, and I and I was kind of arguing within, well, why do we have to find favor in the sight of man? And then all of a sudden, but this is written. This is very important. Okay, if we need to, then we need to reorient something. That means we need to fix or correct something. The image of the cooperation of mercy, of mercy that has come from heaven to truth that has come from the earth is the cooperation of the faith of God and the dissolving of the faith of God in the heart by the faith of man that is expressed in obedience to the faith of God. Being clothed into the image of our new man and the image of the garments of righteousness, we, in fact, through the proclamation of the faith of our heart, are clothed into, into the righteousness of the faith of our heart. And we have turned to the most ancient revelation regarding the mercy of God that is contained in the book of Job, chapter 29, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that it, I were as in months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when His lamp shone upon my head, and when by His light I walked through darkness. Just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me, when, the, when my steps were bathed with cream, and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me, when I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and hid, and aged and the aged arose and stood. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of nobles were hushed and their tongue stuck to the roof of their mouth. He talks about this mercy. The mercy of God had hid, had covered Job. It covered it. In doses, God said, this you can, this you can. And here, don't come near this. This, my mercy will protect it. 
don't go here. And God had allowed this. At this time, God had tremblingly looked at Job. He said to Satan, have you paid attention to my servant Job? Take a look at how faithfully a person, you remember this, that had happened in Scripture. In these words, the Holy Spirit brings the proclamation of Job and seven signs, which for us are the paths of the Lord yielded by the cooperation of His mercy with His truth. First, this is the ability, giving God the right to protect us, to watch over us. Second, it's the ability to walk by His light through darkness. Furthermore, it's the right to have communication, friendly counsel with God. It's the blessing of the, cho- the children that surround us. It's being uh, walking with the steps that are bathed with cream. And it's the right to the rock pouring out rivers of oil for us. And seventh, the right over our nation and the image of our calling. We must pay attention here that the presence of the mercy of God over our tent is the image of our correct relationship toward the delegated authority of God, which is evidence of the fact that in our life and over our life is present the covering or the covering of the mercy of God under the condition that we accept this authority and we submit to it on the conditions of Scripture or the boundaries of Scripture. The sons of obedience to the faith of God are the vessels of mercy on whom the mercy of the Lord dwells on. And therefore, the meaning that is contained in the word mercy is defined by Scripture as the relationship of God with the vessels of mercy. Mercy is restoration. We must be restored. We are in need of this. Preparation. Preparation to meet with the Lord in the air. The mercy of the Lord prepares us. It is care, it is loyalty, faithfulness, kindness. With these contents, the richness of the mercy of the Lord is so wide according to its meaning as well as its application. When studying the cooperation of the mercy of the Lord with truth, we came to the conclusion that the cooperation of the mercy of the Lord with truth is called to participate in defining and regulating the norms of correct relations that are called to be built first between God and man, between man and God, between man and man, in between man and all the earth. And furthermore, to not think of ourselves more or highly than we ought to think, we must pay attention to the fact the presence of the mercy of God in one of the spheres of our life cannot be the automatic guarantee for the presence of it in another sphere. The same way as the Overcoming of one city does not mean that you have overcome or taken over all all cities. Just like the realization of one promise does not mean you have realized all promises. A person is called to remain in humility. Oh, Lord has conducted such a victory. And they say, we won't use a lot of people. Just take 5,000 and go to the city and overtake it. I say, the nose must be in its place. We must correctly balance it between heaven and earth so that we don't lift it up too high. As soon as a person thinks of himself more highly than they ought to think, then he will learn a painful lesson. It's best to dwell in humility. This is our experience. This is our knowledge. This is our certain knowledge. A person is called to dwell in humility. We're talking about humility in the order of God. And therefore, the presence of the mercy of the Lord, each sphere of our life is called to meet certain requirements of God, according to which we are called to bring every sphere of our life into a kind of state in which the mercy of the Lord, through cooperation with truth, could produce in our heart the life of God that yields in our heart the order of the kingdom of heaven. Let your kingdom come. We pray with this. This is referring, so meaning, Lord, let me be built in my, all spheres of my life. Let them coincide to your word. Then the kingdom of heaven will be built in me. Thus, 
It is specifically us and each individual sphere of our essence are called to build a kind of atmosphere which in the subject of our true walk before God could be like a magnet attracting to itself or turning upon itself the favor of God in riches and abundance of his eternal and unchanging mercy because it is specifically from the decision of man and the decisions that come from this will depend on whether or not a person will turn themselves into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. And for this goal, we decided to study four classic questions. What does the mercy of God have? What are the contents of it? And what properties and characteristics is, is it revealed on the pages of Holy Scripture? What is the purpose of what purpose in our prayers is called to fulfill the cooperation of mercy and truth of the Lord? What price must be necessary to pay in order for the mercy of God to become an identificator of our garments of righteousness? By what results should we judge and define that we are truly cooperating with the mercy of God and not with well, not with a forgery or a lie? But our past, to our pastor, God has revealed how to check the truth or how to unveil it and specifically these four questions that we must define we must understand the price because this is a part of man here there is the part of God and the part of man there will be a certain result that is going to be correctly balanced and we must check how closely we coincide with this standard the first price for the right, for the mercy of God to dwell over our tent, it is necessary to not make for ourselves idols. I'm going to uh, straight to the third point because we already talked about the definition, the purpose, and now we're talking about the price. So our part that we are called to fulfill. For the mercy of God, and Pastor gave us seven points, and we are going to go over them. For the mercy of God to dwell over our tents, it's necessary to not make for ourselves any carved images or idols and serve them. Deuteronomy 5, 8 through 10. Do, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So, the Lord God is a zealous God. If a person tries to create some kind of carved image, some kind of hobby or interest, some kind of subject of worship, some kind of interest, his anger will begin to will begin to rise. An idol in our life is all of that which we dedicate ourselves to, what we make ourselves dependent on, and all of that which on the stool of priorities which we value and place as primary as searching for knowledge of God. And this, and this is a long list. God just said, don't do any, make any carved images anywhere, in all spheres. We'll say, I really like to fly, I really like to fly, that I leave church and I go fly, I fly on the parachute, I fly on airplanes and so forth. A person begins to worship this. People say, oh, I don't like to fly. I like ships. This is so interesting to me. He leaves knowledge of God. He, le he leaves his assembly. And he begins to ride on some, some so-called ships. When we were on the ships, we were there a few days with my wife, and we had met two women who... Uh, who Sit up, go from one boat to another, and they're always on the boats. They love, they love boats and ships. They don't want to serve the Lord, and they just explore on these ships all their lives. And there are sometimes those people who don't like assemblies, and they just like scuba diving. They just want to go underneath the water, and there's this word that I forgot what it's called. 
in Russian it's lovers of water. Yes, you can dive underwater, but if this happens during church, then this might perhaps be a carved image. We must leave this carved image. Many years ago, about 20 years ago when we had gotten married, there was a game that existed on the computer. And I was I was enticed by this. I came home from work and I wanted to and I wanted to come and just play that game and I understand that I began to be tied to this and in one moment I receive a signal that if I continue this I had heard I don't remember how I understood this but I had heard that if I continue to do this I will lose rapture that's it that's what I heard I stood on my knees right there at home as I had understood it I said Lord I give you a promise I am never going to play this game again I won't come near it and according to the mercy of God it was interesting to me for just a little while longer, but then that's it. It, it left. The desire had left to be involved with these games. This became a carved image for me. This could be gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I was talking with Daniel, he had met, said this, I'd understand, I'd say, a certain flavor... He said, and I'm explaining with my words what he said, I am zealous so that God can express himself in you in a specific way. And I had to meditate upon this, thought about this, and do you know what was revealed to me? I was, it says, be zealous for heavenly gifts, especially to prophecy, and so that it can be manifested in me. And here I see a person is zealous for this to be exp- manifested in me. And I was lost. Wait a second. If you are zealous, then be zealous inside. Or the gift of knowledge, the gift of counsel. We say, Lord, send your prophecy. And I had always, my, my zeal was always for this to be active in me. And here all of a sudden, he says, we are one. We share the reward together. This is very important. All of a sudden, I had understood. Of course, when I point the arrows to myself, it becomes an idol for me. The Lord enlightens us. Carved images could be gifts of the Holy Spirit, the blessings of God. It could be some kind of creation of God, including man. It says, if whoever loves his mother, father, children, his daughter, that is more precious than life, but it must never be more precious than knowledge of God. Some kind of hobbies can serve as carved images. And finally, our own per- our own persona, when everything begins to surround us and you see something new is revealed to me it turns out that we can be zealous with such diligence Apostle Paul had written all of a sudden this revelation begins to penetrate into our essence deeper he says be zealous so that these gifts of the Holy Spirit can be manifested in them and this must be our zeal when we prepare ourselves for service when we go to hear the word of God we must have this kind of zeal Lord I am going to go to service and pastors are going to speak this word express your light your glory your word and when we are zealous for it to happen in us he says well all of you are gifted that I couldn't even speak with you as with normal spiritual people. I spoke as those who are carnal. And and in this there's no lack of gifts, but inside that there's kind of disorder. 
in the Corinthian church, if we look at the Gospels, if you look at all the letters to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, but he says about the Corinthians, here we see the anger of the apostle toward them. And when we reorient ourselves, the Lord helps us with this. We begin to fulfill the commandments of the Lord. Let, may you not have these carved images. Deuteronomy 7, 9, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Love toward God is called to be expressed in search for God and in knowledge of God, whereas search and knowledge for God is called to be expressed in keeping the commandments of the Lord. We begin to search for God in order to know His commandments. When we know these commandments, we hear and we listen. We express our obedience. We strive to fulfill this word. To keep the commitments of the Lord means to fulfill them. Specifically, it is in the fulfillment of the commandments of the Lord that we demonstrate our love toward God. The fulfillment of the commandments of the Lord allows us, as truth that has come from the earth, to strive to God and to demonstrate our love toward Him. This kind of circumstance immediately gives the mercy of God the opportunity to come down from heaven to the earth that is in our heart. To fulfill the commandments of the Lord, it is necessary to be given a definition for this goal. It's necessary to understand them and to know on which place, with what instruments, and with what means, as well as in what sequence they should be fulfilled. The sequence is important. There is primary things and there are things that are secondary. It's important to place it where they belong. According to Scripture, the opportunity to know the commandments of the Lord, to keep and to fulfill them according to the statutes of God, is possible only in one in one case, through instruction in faith, from or through hearing the word of God from the messengers of God. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. You know, the sons of Israel say, come out of Egypt. They had gone through a very difficult path, and they were baptized in Moses and the cloud and the sea, as we know, symbolize baptism in the water, Holy Spirit, and fire. And then God had said regarding these people, I was anchored that they will not enter my rest because they did not know my ways. Imagine. How is this possible? It turns out that this is possible. A person, he progresses, at the same time, the mercy of God goes by him. He doesn't know the Lord. He is baptized. This baptized grows in him. He must have some kind of gifts, but as we hear, this is not an indicator. However talented and gifted a person may be, this does not mean anything. A question arises, how should we act toward the gift of the Holy Spirit? Because scripture says for us to be zealous for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The answer is simple. We must, ser we must search for the desi desire for knowledge of God in expressing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That we must be zealous for it to be manifested in the church. And second, because we have a correct position, we don't want to see the gifts themselves. We don't make make carved images, but we we desire the knowledge of God. Second, by being zealous over the spiritual gifts, we must strive to comfort the heart of our Father in order to to represent or to give the Holy Spirit the right 
to express himself however he wants to in these gifts. Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The next carved image or idol in our life could become the blessings of the Lord. It is a kind of state of the human heart when it searches not for God, but his blessings, which in the format of the mercy of the Lord can abide over all the desires of the hands of man. We say, Lord, I'm so faithful, I'm so good, well, it's not difficult for you, I have such desires, and you constantly speak these desires to God. But God knows our desires and He fulfills them, but we don't need to in this manner express them to God. You, a lot of people say, please give to me this and give to my child this and give to him that and I ask for this and so forth. There is idolatry in this. There is a carved image. If I have a relationship with God in this way and then there's some kind of destruction, then all of a sudden, Job, Job had a correctly reacted when there was destruction in his life. He says, look, all will, all of his will burn, everything will be taken from him. Take a look at how he will behave. He is holding on to this. He is seeing that value in this. Whereas in fact, blessings of the Lord are called to give success to each person who fulfills the desires of God. Here is what kind of desires we are called to concentrate on, the desires of God. That this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. First John chapter 5, verses 14-15 through 15. I... A sigh in this way, I sigh for myself. Lord, help me to acknowledge this, to know this verse, to know this truth. Help me understand it deeper so that I do not walk around my desires so that I can step away from them. The blessings that we search for, for not the fulfillment of the will of God or not for searching God are transformed into a carved image for us. They will be transformed. Here is one of the standards when the blessings was when a blessing was considered the presence of God. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to you, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give, and I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So, meaning car a carnal Christian. Stiff-necked means uh, a stiff neck. When we hear the word, and we begin to resist it. This is a stiff neck. Stiff-necked people. When we hear the word from the mouth of th those people who are sent by God, we are called to bow our understanding, our opinion, we must, in humility, offer ourselves. Moses said to the Lord, You say to me, Say to the children of Israel, Now therefore take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of the ornaments by Mount Horeb. And so if I have found favor in your sight, I ask you, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. Take a look. First he said, I will send an angel. It will be easier for you. You will inherit a blessing. I heard one mother say, 
there was a man who had gotten engaged to her daughter. She was a family where the people dedicated themselves to God, and this, her future son-in-law, did not. And she said, well, before the Lord, I don't know, but he's a very nice man. She'll be, she'll be better off with him. That will be at peace reg- about her. And I looked at this situation. I, s- I heard nothing, something incorrect. There must not be this kind of relationship. In this life, things might be fine. He might be cared for. Oh, and in eternity, God will deal with, with him. Moses said, I do not agree with any kind of blessing. This will not this will not this will not be so. He says, I will go and bring you into rest. Moses said to him, If you don't go with us, do not lead your do not lead us out. For now, for how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. Then the, he had said, Lord had said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Exodus 33, 1-19. So Moses had agreed with the judgments of God. He said, Lord, you are going to judge, but please do not depart from us. Do not go away from us. Go away from my life. The next carved image or idol in our life is some kind of creation of God, including man. This is a state of the human heart. When it begins to be astonished by the hand, The works of the hands of God more than God himself by attributing the works of the hands of God to themselves. Job 31 verses 24 through 28. If I have made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much, if I have observed the sun when it shines or the moon moving in brightness so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, This also would be an iniquity, deserving of judgment, for what I would have denied God, who is above. The next carved image or idol in our life is some kind of hobby, which on the pedestal priorities becomes higher than service to God or a search for God. And one of the most dangerous kinds is service to God in the format of good works or being enticed by evangelism. There are many carved images, and here is a specific format, a specific sequence. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What if he is not taught that the king will reign in righteousness when the grace of God, when Christ will reign through the righteousness in the heart of a person? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, And then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 28. In this case, Christ does not go against service to God in terms of evangelism, but on the pedestal of priorities, he places the rejection of our soul higher than gaining the whole world. The next carved image or idol in our life is our own persona and the dignity of our intellect. So there is some uh, certain selfishness, desires, and there is a kind of 
idol called their intellect that I think is very common in in many churches. There was this war in scripture between the four winds and the four animals. Sometimes that's why it's difficult for us because there's always a war that is happening. The Lord, through His word, through His teaching, He fights in us against the old man. There is the intellect in us. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. It turns out that when we rely on our own intellect, on our own knowledges, our own knowledge, human knowledge, that is not submissive in submission, when we are carnal, we are idolaters. And we go away from the Lord. Our heart begins to stray away from the Lord. You will be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. So when hope comes that everyone waits for, this kind of a person will not see this good. It will come not for him. He will be found in such places that are unfruitful. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, though, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Jeremiah 17, verses 5-8 through eight. We talked about carved images. Now we're going to continue. We have a little bit of time left, and I will try go through these to go through these points. The price for the mercy of God to dwell over our tent, it is necessary to not touch anything that has been sworn by God. But none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you, and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 17. We should note that accursed is all of that which is God's belonging. And therefore, anything that is that begins And the mercy that we wait for when we come across something or we try to take something that is accursed is evil in the eyes of God. Malachi 3, 7 through 10. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. This has happened in the days of the fathers. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. I, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi 3, 7 through 10. We are talking about blessings, the blessings of heaven, and the blessings of below. Here we have the heavenly sources. From there we wait. And there is a sequence. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. In relation to ourselves, we are called. We are called to protect, to act toward ourselves according to the statute of God. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16-17 through 17. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. For he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Therefore, we must act toward our body as a temple of God. Third, for the mercy of God to dwell over our tents is necessary to make the decision to make ourselves for ourselves a goal in any circumstance to turn to the Lord and not to the power of our own intellect. Again, we repeat. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 6 and 10, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Because you have set your heart as a, the heart of a God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. Fourth, for the mercy of the Lord to dwell over our tents, we, like God, must be mercy to the vessels of mercy. Must be merciful to the vessels of mercy. This point, talks about us being able to demonstrate mercy and at the same time being able to give mercy to the vessels of mercy. We must not show this mercy to the vessels of wrath because this same point, it has two sides to it. God says, him you are called to have mercy on and him you are called to punish. Steer away from this person. Your people and your calling will be instead of his people. Here, Pastor reveals the idea that there was a person who had walked from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho, the definition of this city means justification according to faith. A person sought for, a person sought justification not in the works of the law, but in faith. And he was found along the way of thieves. Thieves are those people who don't understand. They are those people who stand at the head of the people of God, but do not understand the righteousness of God, who are carnal. He was found among the thieves, and he had shown him mercy. Go. We must show mercy toward people we must forgive them, cover them, carry them to demonstrate a certain level of attention, honor to those who are walking along this path. They are walking along the path of justification and they are searching for justification in faith, not in certain works. The fifth point. For the mercy of God to dwell over a tent, we must boast not of the flesh, but according to the cross of the Lord Jesus. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of, of our Lord Jesus, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. There is also a sixth and seventh point, and I will touch them um, very briefly. For the mercy of God to dwell over our tents, it's necessary to sow in ourselves righteousness and reap in mercy. There will always be some kind of revelations of God that are going to carry this mercy, and we must prepare our hearts to hearing the word of God, to search for how to accept this truth, to prepare ourselves with the goal to accept the word of God so that upon this earth when a seed will fall in there it can begin to grow so that the soil of our heart can be good and the seventh point for the mercy of God to dwell in our tents it's necessary to serve and fulfill the desires of those people whom God has established to tend to his church he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Allow me to define this cup of cold water with which we are called to accept a person sent by God in order to inherit along with him that level of the mercy of God that is contained in the teaching and revelation that is given to him by God. To share what we have 
is to share our faithfulness to the teaching. Our faithfulness to the teaching, which we, according to the great mercy of God, received through those people whom God has established to tend to His flock in order to bring it into our image and likeness. These are representatives of the fivefold ministry. It is specifically our faithfulness to the teaching that is the cup of cold water. Proverbs 25, 25, As cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. A far country is the kingdom of heaven, simultaneously dwelling in three dimensions, in heaven, in Holy Scripture, and in our hearts. The good news out of this country is accepting the messenger of God and the proclamation of the faith of our heart that expresses faithfulness to the teaching as well as those who give us this teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me. Among them are Phygelus and Hermo Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. His people had left Apostle Paul. When he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. He says, sometimes we ask, Lord, please share. I was also, people shared with me, and I thought, well, look, may the Lord give you, may the Lord grant you. I had, saints had sold their house and had wanted to share in their profits with me. Oh, Lord, bless the saints. Take a look at what, how Apostle Paul blesses. The Lord grant him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. Yes, we can bless. May the Lord give. May the Lord bless. But the central mercy is focused around this. And whoever does not submit, does not obey, this is not good for him. We are called to humble ourselves. It says, obey your messengers. It's beneficial to us when we accept. And it says, when you have given a cup, my person a cup of cold water, my messenger, you will not lose your reward. We will pray and to bring ourselves, bring ourselves the spheres of our life according to that statute that we hear in prayer according to the proclamation before God upon this place. This prayer has a, a great meaning and power when we express these words before God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this mercy. This mercy that has come from heaven which you have outlined for the worship of your holy name. Allow your truth, which we have accepted, into the good soil of our hearts, the prepared soil of our hearts. To meet, to unite on the paths on your paths to become one to acknowledge your ways we dedicate ourselves to bring ourselves according with that truth with that preached word that you speak
through your messenger, person whom you have established, to prepare your people to meet with you. We thank you for our pastor, for his family, May he be blessed along with his wife for, for their labor that they have dedicated themselves fully to. And those that are that here, let, give them the heart of the wise. Give them the opportunity to have this humility the opportunity to accept a seed that you are going to offer to us. We thank you for this, these great riches, your precious promises, which come from your lips accepting and growing with which we are made partakers of your church, your body, and become one with God. We know that the time is drawing near and we need to, f to complete these final steps we need to fulfill your full will upon this earth. I ask you for each one who hears this word to be armed with this, with this thought so that we can take this word and to grow it for you are near. And we stand at the door of hope. We thank you for this great time, for this great mercy, for this triumph, for this unveiling kingdom of yours. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. May it be in our bodies. We thank you for the promise of the erection of the resurrection of life in our bodies. We have accepted it and we thank you and you who have begun this good work in us, who has given us this promise. Help us to grow it. Allow us to see the fruit of this promise with our eyes. May it be fulfilled. We thank you for this mercy. We thank you for all of your mercies. And we bless your holy name, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the hand of the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us conclude with our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.